so thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is probably the longest title of the session. I'm sorry, it's a mouthful. So exoplanet characterization with James Webb, um, particularly focused about um, the Trappist-1 system. And uh, Mamuda gave us a little bit about introduction to that, which is great, because I'm going to zip through the introduction really fast, because I have a lot of stuff to show. Um, so the key big picture here is that uh, M dwarfs are about 3 quarters of the stars in our local group. So if you're thinking about the distribution of life as an astrobiologist, um, both in the solar system and beyond, you kind of want an idea about where life might exist in uh, the local universe. And chances are good that you're going to be looking at an M dwarf around, um, for planets around other stars. Um, so the other good piece of information here is that um, the Kepler statistics show us that M dwarf stars are more likely to are are very likely to have planets around all of them, and the stars that do have planets are likely to have multiple planets. So that's really great, um, and because these M dwarf stars are small and red and cooler, um, they're a lot easier to observe planets around them because of that transit method. Right, you're looking for an Earth-sized planet, and if you're around a smaller, dimmer star, it's much easier to see that signal. So that's really the only way that we'll observe terrestrial exoplanets um, around other stars in the next 20 years is with James Webb. Um, but M dwarf stars have their own problems um, that other stars may not have, and that's a very long, superluminous pre main sequence phase. So, for up to a billion years while the star and planets are forming, um, the star is much brighter than it will eventually be. And so, planets that are in the habitable zone uh, for the main sequence phase, during the pre main sequence phase, they can boil off, you know, tens or hundreds of oceans and build up to thousands of bars of, or atmospheres of oxygen. Um, and this is a serious issue for these planets actually having life eventually. Um, and in addition to this pre-main sequence phase that lasts so long, you have lifelong stellar activity uh, that can continue to sterilize the surface and strip off the atmosphere. So that's, that's maybe a bad <laughs> sign. So, if you're, so with that information, then you ask, how could M dwarf planets even have life? How could they even have an atmosphere? So we need to start asking some of these questions to be able to see if these are even great things to look at for astrobiology. Uh, so our first question might be, do these uh, planets even have an atmosphere? That's kind of the first bit of information you want when you observe them. Next might be, are these massive oxygen atmospheres I'm talking about, which are just theorized at this point, right? We don't have an oxygen, a massive oxygen planet in our solar system. We just have the life-based oxygen around Earth. Um, that's also a problem for a false, um, false biosignature, right? So are those types of planets even possible or common even? Um, or do you get a more Venus-like planet? Looking at our solar system, we know a Venus-like planet can exist, and this is a post-runaway greenhouse planet. Are these perhaps the most common um, types of planets around an M dwarf star? Or, and perhaps the only way you can really get a habitable planet in the um, habitable zone of an M dwarf star is can you have some kind of mini Neptune, a more hydrogen-rich, volatile-rich planet? Can this migrate in during formation, strip off its hydrogen envelope, and leave you with a habitable evaporated core, which was posited a few years ago by Rodrigo Luger et al. So spectral observations by James Webb will help us uh, distinguish or <laughs> show whether these types of planets can occur and distinguish among them, hopefully. So we've already heard a little bit about TRAPPIST-1. This is a great system. I'll just hit it briefly again. Three planets inside the inner edge of the habitable zone, three planets within the conservative habitable zone, and at least one planet beyond the outer edge. So this gives you a great single system to look at planetary evolution um, among seven different targets, which is really great. Uh, so just for the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about the climate model and the chemistry model I use, um, show some of the modeling results in terms of the atmospheres and their structures um, and their chemistry, and then go into some of the spectral signatures, which is really the, the point of, of the work I'm doing. So the model I use is a 1D climate model. This is a very rigorous line-by-line uh, -line, uh, radiative convective model that you use multi-scatter and all sorts of great stuff um, that you use um, to, you can model Earth and all the solar system planets with these. Um, and this is coupled to a photochemical kinetics model because, as, as I said, M dwarfs have really crazy UV. And so, in order to really understand what might happen to an atmosphere around an M dwarf, you have to understand what the UV is doing to the chemical species in the atmosphere. Uh, once I've converged on a photochemical and climate equilibrium state, um, then this uses the exact same radio transfer model to produce very high resolution spectra that can then be degraded. Um, and so you can see what they might look like for uh, James Webb. So when we're considering what kind of atmospheres I'm modeling, um, I'm mostly modeling thick um, evolved atmospheres, right? Atmospheres that have evolved from their primordial composition. This spans from a recent ocean loss type uh, system where we said, oh, okay, it just lost its, its water from the pre-main sequence phase, and perhaps you're just left with mostly um, oxygen. 
And then perhaps if that planet was not totally desiccated from its interior, that it might have outgassing like Earth, like Venus, like Io. Um, then you have other constituents that are volcanic that can be emitted, so you can look at that. And then all the way to the Venus-like end of the spectrum um, where you just have a runaway greenhouse planet and this is what you're left with. But since this is an astrobiology conference, um, let's also consider what um, an Earth-like planet might look like. Right? All the other previous ones I showed are not really anything that we would expect life of, that we know it to, to live on, but I'm comparing this with an ocean-bearing planet that perhaps could develop life. So we can see if we can distinguish these. Uh, now, when I model these atmospheres and come up with the surface temperatures, um, the story becomes more complicated. The habitable zone is only a first order indicator of habitability, but if you stick different types of atmospheres on the same planet, um, you end up finding that uh, the habitable zone is not a guarantee of habitability. You can have planets <laughs> span from 600, past 600 Kelvin if you have a Venus-like atmosphere, um, all the way down to a uh, very low, cold 180 Kelvin for just an oxygen atmosphere on a colder planet. Um, so this is kind of a problem, but the habitable zone is still a place that is more likely. Right? An aqua planet um, gives us some more cases, so we have more good green colored, <laughs> maybe habitable temperatures um, in the habitable zone than we have outside of it. So it's still a good indicator. Now with the modeling results, here's pressure and temperature structures and chemistry. I'm just going to breeze through these really fast. Um, but just a couple important points. Um, the previous speaker talked about phase curves, and that can tell you something about the temperature structure of the planet. And so that's one way you can observe an oxygen planet is because there's no water, um, the oxygen absorption actually creates a temperature inversion near the surface. And this may be observable by a thermal phase curve, um, but I'm not going to show any of those in this talk. Um, this, these planets are otherwise distinguished by high ozone levels because there's no water to scrub out the ozone, which happens in Earth's troposphere. Um, and the same thing, you get carbon monoxide buildup in the atmosphere. These might be uh, observable. Now, if you have a little more outgassing with an oxygen planet, you end up losing this temperature inversion. At the surface, you create a more uh, typical terrestrial adiabat of a temperature. Um, but this is a lot warmer. You get some, uh, some water in the atmosphere, and this ends up going basically into a runaway greenhouse state, as you can see, where you have um, even more than 0.1% you know, water in the, in the upper atmosphere, indicating that the planet's losing water. But you get a lot less carbon monoxide, um, and you get a little bit less buildup of ozone, but this is still fairly substantial. So that's pretty interesting. Then if we go to a Venus-like planet, and as far as I know, this is the first real um, exo-Venus modeling I've ever seen, so yay. <laughs> Um, but you end up seeing that even a Venus around M dwarf still looks kind of Venus-like. These white lines are the Venus ones, and each color is the, each planet. You'll notice there's no TRAPPIST-1b here because the planet is too hot to actually form sulfuric acid clouds. So that really is not going to be quite as Venus-like. Um, and that's maybe good news or bad news for a couple of reasons. Um, but you see these planets can still form sulfuric acid clouds, and here's the optical depth that I form in this photochemical model. Um, and so you still might get clouds, which is, if you followed any of the exoplanet work with Hubble Space Telescope, that might be a serious problem for transit spectroscopy. Now that I've burned through some of the climates, um, let's look maybe more at what we might actually observe. So here's a very confusing spectra of um, TRAPPIST-1c, the second planet, with all of its cases I modeled. So you have the oxygen cases down here in green and purple, and then the Venus-like cases up here in yellow and red. Um, and what you see here is that, first of all, where is your signal coming from? Since, like so the previous speakers have said, your transit spectrum is light from um, within, from the star, not from the planet, so it's passing through the atmosphere. So that's where your strongest signal is. So keep that in mind when you're looking at how big some of these features are and where the signal is. But you get CO2 features, right? That goes back to our first question is, how do we know these planets even have an atmosphere? The most universal sign for a terrestrial planet is probably going to be carbon dioxide. Every planet I modeled had some carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide produces very strong signals in multiple wavelength bands. So that's probably the first place to look for whether a planet has an atmosphere. Um, the next thing we might be interested in is a water signal. Um, for a planet like this, in the inside, in, inside of the inner edge of the habitable zone, water is not necessarily a good sign. Um, these have very strong water features, and this is actually a sign that there's water in the stratosphere, and so your planet's actually losing water. So that's maybe not a good thing to see. Um, I mentioned the oxygen planets, so you can actually distinguish these from their heavy oxygen. So you get oxygen collision because the atmospheres are so dense and have sufficient oxygen for that. So that's a signal we can actually look for as well. Um, ozone, again, is another thing that maybe might be an issue for false um, biosignatures. 
And then you have other gases like sulfur dioxide, which indicate volcanism, and that is maybe a good or bad thing for whether the planet is active, uh, geologically active, or is this thing more Venus-like? Um, CO also indicates desiccation, so that's not good. But so trapezoid E, this is probably, I think the literature is mostly in agreement that trapezoid E is probably the best target for trappist one um, for a potentially habitable planet. Um, and so I've plotted the, the aqua planet as well, and that's these two spectra down here. And since they're one bar, their um, transmission spectra get deeper into the atmosphere, in fact, deep enough to start seeing water features from the troposphere. And in this case, you can see that the water features are actually kind of similar if you look at the relative transit depth from the top of the signal to the bottom of the signal. They're roughly the same. Um, and that's because these, even the runaway greenhouse planets have a little bit less water in their atmosphere. So it's really hard to distinguish whether this planet has an ocean just from seeing a water feature in the atmosphere. Ozone feature is a little bit smaller for an Earth-like planet, so that might be good, but that really might be hard to distinguish. Um, but the other thing you get from an Earth-like planet, right, is methane. Um, that's hopefully something a lot of biologists study, and there's a methane talk later um, in the session. Um, and this is only abiotic levels of methane, and it's still showing up as a signal in my spectra. One thing, if you're familiar with some of the other M-dwarf terrestrial exoplanet literature, is M-dwarfs, M-dwarf planets have a lot higher um, capability of seeing uh, more methane, uh, much more methane than Earth gets. So this is actually Earth levels of methane from only geological levels of fluxes. So you can imagine that these methane bands could be much stronger um, from an actual biosphere. So those were beautiful, perfect, pristine spectra, even though they're really scary looking. Um, there was no error bars on them. Uh, so what happens when a telescope is actually trying to observe this planet? Um, this is going to be a lot more difficult case. Um, this, this one right here is TRAPPIST-1b, the innermost planet, probably the easiest to observe because it's the hottest. Um, it's fairly large compared to the other ones. Um, so this one produces very strong signals, up to 200 parts per million um, from an instrument that um, has a noise floor of probably 30 parts per million. So this you can actually see. You can see the CO2 feature if you're looking at the dots. You can see actually a water feature, a CO2 feature, water. So this is actually great. And this is only 10 occultations or 10 transits um, to observe this planet. So that's actually doable with James Webb, hopefully. So we have a uh, capability here of perhaps observing this planet and actually seeing spectral features. Now, I mentioned clouds before. Clouds are a serious problem. So let's look at TRAPPIST-1c, which could form sulfuric acid clouds. Um, the cloud deck is right here, right? It truncates the transmission spectrum at the top of the cloud deck. Um, and so this is a serious problem because now our signal went from maybe 200 parts per million to now it's half that. Um, and so that's a lot more difficult. And here's the number of occultations you'd have to get to a signal noise of 5 or 10, um, 15 for TRAPPIST-1c for a Venus-like atmosphere, or if you have a Venus-like atmosphere that actually has clouds. Um, now you're up to 80, and I don't think the James Webb committees have determined how much time is going where or are ever going to approve 80 transits as something like 100, 200 hours of time on a very expensive telescope that has to compete with other science. So now, uh, that was already really bad. Um, the habitable planet, potentially TRAPPIST-1e, um, this, this looks pretty scary, right? You can see a CO2 band, but this is 50 or 100 transits of this planet to be able to see these features. So this maybe is something that once we really understand the noise characteristics of James Webb and if it's favorable, uh, maybe this is something we can convince um, the observers in charge of um, the telescope to look at something like TRAPPIST-1e long enough to actually be able to distinguish an atmosphere on this planet. Otherwise, if you just look at five transits in TRAPPIST-1e, you're, you're not going to see anything and not going to learn anything. So what data do we have now? Uh, previous speaker, Arthur, mentioned uh, photometry. So we did look at the photometric bands from Spitzer um, and Kepler that are available. Um, and we find that our models kind of fit the data here. But the Spitzer bands, Spitzer really struggles with seeing a terrestrial planet. They tried. This really doesn't rule out anything. Uh, straight line, my spectra. Hey, but at least they're kind of going the right way. Um, but that's probably confirmation bias. Um, but everything's still consistent, so everything's still available. Um, I think I'm out of time now, so I'll just leave up my uh, conclusions, primarily that um, stellar activity drives the composition of the atmosphere, which drives the photochemistry, and that drives the climate, and what you might observe. Um, and that these planets, while they may be observable by James Webb with features up to 200 parts per million for the most favorable cases, um, we really have to consider hard our observing strategy for the smaller planets and whether we'll be able to detect biotype molecules. Thank you. I'll take questions.
Any questions? To your left. <laughs> so pretty, mu <clears throat> pretty much all of these planets are in some sort of mean motion resonance and probably all tidally locked. Yep. Probably. How do you, do, does the model account for a lack or a possible, you know, some amount of circulation between them? And do you see big variations in the day and night side spectra? So I don't model the day or night side. This is a 1D model. Um, I am working on a kind of day and night side type model to be able to do um, more difficult planets that way. Um, I've done a, some, some comparison from uh, work on Proxima Sen B um, on comparing 1D to 3D models. And so for thick, uh, say, um, atmospheres like Venus that have um, very good thermal um, capabilities there, you can actually find that, uh, let's see, I have, that, yeah, so like one of the sums that were shown is that, okay, if you have a resonance, um, your atmosphere is, can be smeared out, and so the day and night side is quite similar. Um, and that's one reason why we can use a 1D model here. Um, I found that the temperatures, when you're looking at the surface temperatures, which is primarily what I'm um, looking at in terms of habitability, uh, that the surface temperatures that the 3D modelers got from the LMD model um, from Proxima Sen work by Turbet et al. in 2016, um, under the exact same assumptions for the 1D model, um, they get very similar answers within 5 or 10 Kelvin in most cases. Um, the other thing to think about is, uh, let me look at that one, but for an ocean-bearing planet like the aqua planet, um, if you actually do include ocean heat transport, um, which is very, very computationally expensive in 3D models, so typically they don't do that. Um, but some work by Yang, um, Hu and Yang, or Yang et al. in 2014 um, actually showed that you get a lot more ocean heat transport to the back side of the planet, even in a synchronously rotating, rotating case. Yeah. So the, the caveats are with 1D is we can do the radiation much, much better, but you lose any information about the dynamics. So you really kind of need to understand um, both cases to know what's going on with the planet. Yeah. But we are working towards more spatial radiation. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to go back to when you were talking about um, M dwarf planets preferential, or well, M dwarf planets that preferentially have high methane concentrations that are abiotic and at Earth-like levels. Am I right in uh, um, interpreting that as atmospheric loss processes sort of blow off other species, and then the methane is preferentially left behind, or is that not right? No, that's a great question. Um, so, but uh, that's not really right. Um, methane, so the, the methane is a little bit more confusing because methane survives easier around an MDORF, even though it has a lot more far UV flux and a lot more Lyman alpha, um, it still survives stronger because of the other processes such as ozone that destroy methane. So it's, so it's not that the destruction of methane directly by the star is much different. It's that the destruction of methane by other molecules, such as water and such as ozone, is much reduced because the NUV absorption, the near UV, that's more like um, what ozone absorbs in our Earth's atmosphere, um, that UV level is actually much less compared to G dwarfs. So you actually get longer methane lifespans, and so even the same flux of methane results in just more methane building up in the atmosphere. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.